The next kind of device we have is a PLC. So talk a little bit about the history of PLC. So anybody familiar with what that diagramming technique is on the right there? Go ahead. Ladder logic. So what is ladder logic? Where does it come from? Ladder logic is how electricians used to, or engineers used to specify, and electricians used to wire control panels before they were RTUs, right? So when the first PLC came out in the late 60s, they were trying, what they were trying to do is they wanted to make these devices programmable because what would happen is I'd have this big panel and I'd change my automation and I had to get an electrician out there and rip a bunch of stuff out of the panel and rewire it to do the new control approach. So they wanted to be able to do that with software. So PLCs came to the market, but the problem was the people that were using the PLCs were not software programmers. They were electricians. So they came up with ladder logic as a way to configure the PLCs so that the people who were used to doing electrical work could use the PLCs to do the same thing. Nowadays, most people don't program in ladder logic. They pro program in structured text or isograph or something like that. But historically, that's where it comes from. So PLCs are programmable, they're smart. So with an RTU, I pull it off the shelf, I install it, I do a little bit of configuration, I'm rocking and I'm rolling. With a PLC, I have to get a smart person to write code and put the code in the device to make it do a job, right? They are designed for process automation and they're designed for what I would call critical control, meaning Control where if I lose control, I could have an adverse outcome from a safety or environmental standpoint. There's a lot of manufacturers. Typically, if I, you know, if I buy a PLC, and I'm talking about the bigger ones, not like the, the micros, but the bigger ones, I buy a processor, and then I buy a COM card, and I plug it in, and I buy I.O. cards, and I plug, plug them in. I buy remote I.O. cards, and I plug them in. So we got a chassis, and I'm plugging a bunch of stuff and expanding it based on what I need to do. Some of the PLCs, some of the manufacturers of these guys, make triple redundant PLCs. So everything, the communications, the processor, the I.O., all of it is redundant threefold. That stuff was developed primarily for the nuclear power industry when they needed to have absolute surety that they're going to maintain control of the process. So they also support other kinds of uh, programming. Um, they have a lot of proprietary buses and such. So they're designed for process control, high reliability. So, you know, I'm not going to lose control of the process. They require power. So where an RTU almost always is kind of a low power and, you know, they're kind of designed to be run off of solar kits, PLCs, particularly the bigger ones, are not really designed to be run off batteries. And if you're going to put them on batteries, the solar array and the battery kit, you know, it's non-trivial. It can be tens of thousands of dollars to power up and run one of those things. They require bandwidth. I need, a, I need a wide band communications network behind the PLC to the RTUs, or to the, uh, sorry, to the IO, remote IO components. They have to be programmed and they need environmental control. So there are PLCs like the Allen Bradley Micro that are, are a lot more forgiving, but the bigger stuff that you would use to run like a, gas extraction facility or something like that, they all require um, some kind of environmental, generally you're gonna put them in a building with air conditioning, probably with AC power and maybe with battery backup. So what happens with a PLC is they're, they're a lot more capable, but they're way more expensive to deploy. All right, so this is a diagram of a PLC architecture. Now, just looking at this, what do you notice that's different versus the RTU? 
Lots more complexity, absolutely. Yeah, there's some redundancy. I actually have multiple communications methods. So I've got this MUX that kind of ties things together, and then I've got a control bus with the CPU, and then I've got other kinds of communication protocols, so a lot more you know, communications capacity so I can do more things with it. There's also advanced processing. So PLCs, can, you can tell a PLC that, okay, so I've got a PLC and it's running a storage facility, gas storage facility. I can tell the PLC, we're injecting gas and it'll operate differently. It'll say, well, when I'm injecting gas, I want to alarm this way and I want to control these things. And when I'm withdrawing gas, I want to alarm a different way and I want to control different things, right? So different things are important versus based on operating mode. Right, so a lot more capability. I can I can do first in, first out um, programming. So, you know, if I get this trip first, I'm going to do this. If this trip comes behind it, it has a precedence unless I'm in this operating condition. So, a lot more that you can do with these things. And of course, with that power comes cost. So, <clears throat> summarizing this. In general, PLCs are more expensive than RTUs. They have a whole lot more communications capability. They're generally gonna need some kind of environmental control. Um, they're gonna support a lot more protocols, probably more than just their own internal proprietary protocol. They've got protocols to integrate to other things. And they're commodity manufacturer, meaning a PLC is a PLC is a PLC. I've got to engineer it, design it, program it. Okay? So, any questions about that, RTUs versus PLCs? Now, here, here's the reality. The guys who make RTUs are adding capability and they look more like PLCs. And the guys that make PLCs are doing micros and smaller and low power, you know, so that, you know, they're, they're migrating into each other's space. What I, what I try to do as I'm looking at this is I'm thinking about, well, I'll put it to you this way. When I'm, when I'm looking at the cost and complexity of a SCADA implementation, in this day and age, it's generally a lot less about the equipment versus the human resources. You actually have to look really hard at the human resources to implement, maintain, control as hard as you look at the technologies. Because PLCs are gonna require higher paid, higher skilled persons to deploy and maintain than RTUs, typically, right? So, the other thing I could say about this, so RTUs, a PLC in 1980 that would control a you know, a gas extraction facility, probably fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars before I put all the you know other stuff on it, just for the PLC itself. Nowadays, I can get the same PLC for ten to twenty thousand dollars. So, like everything else, the prices of these devices has come way, way down. Let's talk about EFM. So, EFM stands for electronic flow meter. So, an electronic flow meter is a specialized RTU. It, it does flow measurement, and they have liquid EFM and gas EFM. They, like RTUs, are for purpose. They're designed to be low power, um, but they do custody transfer measurement. So custody transfer means the ownership of the product is changing hands, which means it's subject to audit, it falls under Sarbanes-Oxley, which is the regulatory requirements for how public companies report and manage all their internal financial processes. And they're governed by some specifications from the American Petroleum Institute. The big thing from a SCADA perspective about EFM devices is they're big data sets. So if I go and I, if I, go and I can, you know, bring data back from an RTU, I'm probably bringing five to maybe 20 signals back. Some pressures, some flows, some temperatures, you know, not a big data set. If I'm going to a PLC, 
I'm probably bringing lots of signals back, particularly if it's in a local automation like a compressor station or something like that. These are RTUs with big data sets because they have arrays of hourly flow. So every hour they build a flow record and the flow record has the volume, the energy, the BTU, the uh, average static pressure, the average temperature, the average DP, the coefficient, uh, all the gas analysis values, et cetera, et cetera. It has, I get all my alarms, I get all my vents, and I get a full set of configuration records. So a big data set, right? So when I'm, again, when, when I'm analyzing a, a SCADA system and I want to know, I'm trying to get some determination about its complexity and what it needs from communication standpoint, I want to know how many EFM because I know the data requirements are different. Is this making sense? 